Hi, guys. I can see that some people are already here. That's awesome. Thank you for joining. Um, can you give me a heads up about the sound and the picture? Can you see and hear me well? Just let me know in the comments. Okay, um, can I get some feedback, guys? Can you hear me well? Can you, is the picture good? Okay, um, yeah, great. Like, looks like you can see me and hear me well, that's perfect. Thank you all so much for joining. So good to see you guys. Um, I hope you are doing well and staying healthy. I know that the situation is kind of different depending on the, you know, on your location where you are. So I just hope that you and your loved ones and your families are doing well. Okay, um, thank you for letting me know. Looks like you can see and hear me well. Okay, awesome. Thanks for your feedback. Okay, so... While some of you are still tuning in, let me just briefly introduce myself for those of you who don't know me yet or who are joining one of my live streams for the first time. So my name is Anna and what I do is I help people market their professional stories, whether it's on paper, like their resume, on LinkedIn or in person during networking or during job interviews. And ultimately I help them get hired and find great jobs. So if you know me at all, or if you've been following some of my content online, you know that I talk a lot about LinkedIn as one of the most important tools, not just for your job search, but for your professional development, for your career in general. Um, and you know that one of the things that I love the most about LinkedIn is that it can be an ongoing growth and development process as opposed to just a quick remedy when you need a job. So if you are only using LinkedIn to hit the easy apply every once in a while, you're just using a small fraction of everything that LinkedIn has to offer. So I hope to help you change that and I hope to help you find your secret sauce in your job search and your career so that no matter where the virus is and what hits us next, you're going to do great in your professional lives because that's what makes people happy and that's what makes me happy in the work that I do every day as well. Um, so actually the topic for today is not so much around LinkedIn, which I guess is one of the favorite, my favorite things to talk about, but today we're going to be talking about resumes and I mean, whatever your situation is and whatever strategy you're using in your job search, your resume will always, always be the one, one of the most important tools that you're going to be using. So that means that, you know, hopefully today is going to help you step up your job search game and realize that you might be doing some things in your resume that are ruining your chances for an interview. And I know that those can be really hard to get these days. So I, I hope to help you change that. And while more people are joining, I have a question for you guys. Um, what industry are you in? Just kind of curious what kinds of professionals we have today. Um, just would love to hear what industry you're from so that we could also, you know, learn from each other, share. And I know that even like, um, so I'm doing these live streams regularly for those of you who have never seen one before. And um, I did one like two weeks ago or so. And I know that a few people made new connections just in the comment section under my live stream, which is awesome. And there were some great networking conversations. And I know that a couple people even got interview opportunities out of it. So, you know, um, just a little encouragement to network in the comments. Okay, we have IT, we have HR, we have data analysts, we have banking, web development, sales, financial services, accountants, healthcare, education, sales, engineering, system administrator, Awesome, accounting. Wow, that's so great, you guys. I'm so happy to see su such different professionals come together. I mean, that's awesome. Again, thank you all so much for joining. Okay, so now let's get to the good stuff. Let's talk about the 
newest and latest in resume writing. Um, so as I already said earlier, I, I see resumes every single day because many people know me as a resume writer. So that's what I do. I help people write their resumes and I help them to tell their stories using their resumes. And what I see a lot um, in the default settings of people's resumes is that without even realizing what you are doing wrong, you might be jeopardizing your chances for connecting with the employer and making the right kind of first impression and truly showing your best. So like super often I get clients who have such amazing backgrounds, who are so great at what they do, but their resume doesn't even say half of how cool and amazing they are and how much value they can add to the business. So I guess, you know, one mantra or whatever we can call it for today is to think about how you can show your best self on your resume to make sure that you're not underselling yourself. That's the most common thing that is happening these days, especially if you haven't looked for work in a while and you haven't updated your resume in a while. That's the number one thing. Understanding how to compellingly sell your your core skills, your the, the things that you're really good at in a way that would convince the, the other, like the hiring side, right? So, um, you know, I'm going to be like the format for today, again, pretty much as always is I'm going to be talking for maybe 15 to 20 minutes, and then I'll get to all of your questions. I'll try to take as many of those as I can within the time frame that we have today, but you're more than welcome to comment and to ask questions throughout the the, the session and then I'll just scroll back up to them. And the other thing is, you know, I, I'm like, I'm a believer in practical, very applicable things that you can implement right away. So if you want to, you can open up your resume right now and literally, you know, look at it while I'm talking and while I'm walking you through those um, things that can make or break your resume. And you can even start taking notes or you can even start making some small fixes there right away. So while others are, you know, sitting there and waiting for things to happen or just uh, contemplating what to do next, we are going to get stuff done. So uh, if you want, open up your resume right now and we're going to get started. So the very first thing that can break your resume, truly break it. And I mean it with, you know, with the with the strongest possible meaning of the world of the word break. Uh, the words responsible for. If you have those words in your resume, we got to get rid of that stuff right away. And there are two reasons. Reason number one is because, well, it's really redundant. It does not add any value in terms of how you're positioning yourself on your resume and how you're selling your, your best skills and your best qualifications. And the other thing is whenever you have that expression responsible for, that means that right away, you are targeting a list of tasks and just and duties and responsibilities. So you're immediately giving people an impression of here comes my job description. So for someone who is an HR or a recruiter or a hiring manager, if all they've been doing all day is looking at people's resumes, trust me, they do not want to see yet another job description on there. So how can we fix that? we need to show results and accomplishments because job tasks and job responsibilities do not sell. Accomplishments and results sell. So what are those? Let's talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So when you have a certain, I mean, obviously you do certain tasks and you have certain job functions that are expected of you or that used to be part of that role that you're describing in your resume. But ultimately, it's the, 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 there's a why behind it, right? So there's a reason why you're doing that task, that ultimate goal or that ultimate expectation that is supposed to make some kind of a difference in the business. That is a result or an accomplishment. So some of those things can be quantifiable. So you can actually measure that impact in percentages, in dollars, in hours, in other metrics. Some of them are more of a qualitative uh, results as well. So the, the number one question that always kind of comes to mind is, well, how do I really quantify the impact of the work that I do if what I do, let's say, is not directly related to, let's say, sales, right? So for those of you who, um, who do come from sales, well, you have a ton of metrics. You have targets, you have sales volumes, you have profit margins, 
Um, you like you have, you know, market share, you have growth, all of those things that are so easy to quantify and probably you are tracking them regardless, right? So that is something that is part of your performance reviews or is just part of your own uh, monitoring of your success and your progress. What should we sh like? What should the rest of us, the people who do not have metrics that are so direct and so straightforward, what should we do? Well, guys, if that's the case, look for those qualitative things. What does that look like? If you improved a certain process, so maybe it used to have a lot of redundant tasks or a lot of parts where like something took so long to process or there was a lot of paperwork and unnecessary steps involved. So if you manage to improve that and get rid of some of those steps, that is an accomplishment. Or maybe there was a special project that had higher importance or higher priority than some other projects in the company and you, specifically you, were selected to handle that project. So potentially your boss or your managers, they could have chosen um, anybody, but they chose you. So you were handpicked for that specific assignment. That also tells something. That tells about the level of trust. That tells um, a lot about the level of your professionalism and that people would actually select you literally out of a group of others to entrust you with a special critical project or a task with with higher importance so that also is a qualitative accomplishment and it is just as valuable as a metric but if you think about it in a lot of cases you can actually quantify those impacts and what you need to do is you just need to take your thinking one step further so let's say if you did improve a process and you did get rid of a few steps that made that, you know, that those that were unnecessary or they were redundant or they just increased the, the number of hours needed to complete that entire process. So what you could do is you could estimate how long that process took before those changes happened and then estimate how long that process would take on average, again, on average, um, after you implemented those changes. So that difference in hours is quantifiable and you can then you know, multiply it by the number of people who are doing those tasks or whatever. But I hope you see where I'm going with this. So basically there is a way to take that task that you were part of, take it one or two steps further and really try to measure that impact that you could have or that you did create on the business. And in a lot of the cases, it would actually be quantifiable. So even if let's say you did save the, um, you know, so there was a person that was supposed to be hired to do a specific job, but then you figured out a way how to automate that process. And now the company did not need to hire that person anymore. So technically, or maybe there used to be a whole other person who would handle that task, but now that person was transferred to do something else because you did automate that task. So technically you did save the company the amount that they were paying that person per, per month. So if even for one month, that person didn't need to, to do that job anymore and could redirect their efforts and their talents somewhere else, you did save that amount of money that would have been their salary if they were doing that task. So. That's just one example. And I know that, you know, there could be a million specific scenarios applicable to your situation specifically, but I hope you get the idea. So the number one takeaway from today, I guess, is try to take those tasks and accomplishments to the next level. Think of those results. Maybe at first you simply convert a task oriented statement, right? So did that, did this into something that has a result or has an outcome. And then let's say tomorrow, if you want to take it one step further, you'll open your resume up again and just think, can I really try and quantify something or measure or create some kind of a ballpark estimate of the impact that I was able to create? So that would already be a huge step forward that could help your resume stand out from a pile of hundreds of other candidates. Because you would be surprised that even like super high profile candidates who you know, are competing for really high level executive positions still list more tasks than accomplishments in their resume. So I would say, you know, you, you might need to mention a few important tasks to, well, get some keywords in there and to just give it like a summary of an overview of the role if it's not clear 
what or maybe if it well if it's not clear for sure but at the same time when let's say your title said one thing but what you actually did was a little bit more than that or a little bit different from what the title would normally mean in that case it is a good practice to include a summary of some of those key functions but that is just like one or two short statements but then the impactful part is to show those accomplishments and results so to sum up, results and accomplishments do make a really great resume. They turn a very plain, very average resume into something truly exceptional and great. So number two, the second thing that, um, you know, that, that can ruin re your resume really is poor formatting. And you'd be surprised because a lot of people think, well, it's just a resume. How much formatting do I need in there? It's, you know, simple, basic document. But every now and then, um, well, if, probably literally, literally every time, I see resumes that are jam-packed with so much text into one page. So you can see that the person somehow fixated on the idea that they cannot have a resume on two pages they have to aim for just one and so they truly did their best in terms of putting as much text as they could on just one page um, i always see those extra long phrases or extra long statements that take like three to four lines and then when a person is actually reading your resume they kind of lose the idea by the time they get to the end of the sentence like that is also something that can be really confusing and the best part is that a lot of the times in those resumes you read that or those people write that they have attention to detail. And that is always, you know, that always makes me smile because you cannot just say you have attention to detail or better don't say it, but actually show it with your resume. So that's why we're here today, because I think the number one um, you know, key to actually proving that you have attention to detail is to first of all realize that those little details actually are really important. And sometimes you only have seconds to impress an employer and unlock an amazing career opportunity for yourself. And I would personally hate to miss that opportunity just because I didn't do a really good job formatting my resume and creating a really good impression with that one um, text file. So um, one very important thing to realize is that, you know, formatting does matter because even when your resume does get through the applicant tracking system, which for those of you who may not have heard of this yet, but probably most of you have, is the software that screens your resume for keywords and decides whether you are a good candidate and whether your resume should be passed along to an HR or recruiter or someone on the hiring side. So basically, if you are good with the ATS, if you did everything the ATS wanted, um, it's going to pass you along to a human person, right? And that human person would need to have a look at your resume and literally in seconds decide whether they want to give you a call. So do you want them to get the right impression? Obviously, you do. And that means that it is your job to make your resume readable and really easy to skim through quickly. Because, I mean, we could talk about the drawbacks and disadvantages of the hiring process all we want. We'd probably spend hours and hours talking about this. But I believe that it's more important to focus on the things we can control rather than the things that are totally outside of, of our control. And one of the things we can control is the quality of your messaging. So. Part of that is to actually make that message easy for the person to read, right? So if I only have seconds, if I have to look at a hundred resume in a day, I'm not going to be reading into every single detail right away. I'll probably just to take a quick first glance and depending on that first impression, whether some of the most crucial requirements are satisfied, I will then decide, oh yeah, that person does seem interesting. I want to give them a call and I want to find out, find out more. So the message of this is that it is your job to make your resume look good, look easy to skim through and friendly to the human eye. How do you do that? Now is the time for the actionable stuff. First of all, you pay attention to the top third of the, of the page one. That is the most important section of your resume. That's kind of like an intro to the whole thing. So if that section hits on some of those critical points and gets to the good stuff right away, then people will want to keep reading and reading like, you know, further the entire document. 
And a lot of the times people kind of treat this top of, per, of page one as more of a, well, I just have to check that item off of my list, right? So I just have to write something, but really I don't know why I'm doing this because the most important part is the experience section. Of course, the experience section is important, but you need to get the person interested first. And mo mo most often, I feel like the top of page one, people treat it as a moment to just stall the attention, right? So I'll just say something without saying anything, and then they'll just read into the experience section. Well, no, that's not how it works. If they see that you're stalling them at the very top, they are way less likely to read any further, and we want them to read further. So get to the good stuff right in that top section um, of your page one. Also, be generous with blank space, because trying to jam pack as much stuff as you can onto one piece of paper does not it's not gonna get you the job, right? So you need to make sure that you are focusing on the most crucial information, but also that that information is, you know, you can separate one bullet from another at least, or that it's because when you don't have enough blank space, that's when it becomes hard for the human eye to skim through the, the text body really quickly. So be generous with blank space and don't think that if you, save on blank space and jam pack more text that that's going to benefit you quite the opposite i know that it's a little bit counterintuitive for some people but uh, let me tell you when there is not enough blank space your resume becomes really hard to read when it becomes harder to read the person on average is less likely to do it i don't want to play with those chances maybe you do i wouldn't so that's why i always add enough blank space also, those super long statements that I talked about, try to break them up. Because again, those long phrases that take more than two lines in your paragraphs, they are really hard to kind of keep up with. So it's better to you know, make a point in a more concise form. That's what your resume is for, for you to be concise and get straight to the point. Also, when you're listing things and you're using bullet points, um, try to keep each bullet point to like two lines max because sometimes I see those massive bullet points that are like four to five lines so they basically make up for an entire paragraph and that looks weird and again hard for the eye to skim through because anyways the eye always goes to the first top line of that bullet so that beginning of your bullet point if you will needs to be most impactful and the strongest part of what you're trying to sell also visually separate your sections of the resume. So if there is education and professional development, or maybe there's volunteering and community involvement, there's your summary or highlights of qualifications or whatever you call that. There is your professional experience. So visually, each of those sections need to be separated from one another because again, when I need to just look at, into the pro, like professional experience, my eye goes directly to that section. That is also really important and it doesn't require professional designer skills to do that. And I guess the, the last thing that I'm going to mention here, and I know that it may sound super simple and trivial, is avoid typos. And I know that that's like super basic advice, but trust me, every now and then, even in resumes of really highly qualified, highly skilled people, I see those typos and grammar mistakes sometimes and... You know, I mean, it's not it's not a huge deal, but again, attention to detail. We want to prove on pra in practice that you actually do have that attention to detail, because those little parts of your presentation they matter, and the people who are reading your resume they will see that if you take such good care of your own presentation, if you clearly you know showcase top professionalism and use every opportunity to show your best self you'll probably use the same approach when it comes to working at that company and positioning them their brand their product whatever it is so if you are writing your resume in a rush or if you are like maybe grammar is not your strongest thing then ask someone else to check your spelling and grammar i know that it's simple but trust me can never stress that enough and i guess within the formatting point one of the things that I'm going to also mention is that um, 
it's tempting to start adding some fancy graphic elements because that seems to be the trend right now, right? So when you Google resume samples or resume templates, some of them are really, really basic and some of them are like super fancy. They have little icons, they have uh, backgrounds and shapes of different colors and all of that. And I know that that looks great and you can still use that if you're distributing your resume in person, if you want to give it more of a... Um, sophisticated, unique um, look. But if you're applying online, which again, should not be your only strategy in job search, but that's what we're talking about today, right? Making the most out of those online applications, hopefully. Um, so for those ones, if you add any fancy, sophisticated graphic elements, the applicant tracking system does not recognize those. And it can also mess with the entire process of how it will grab information from the file. So it doesn't mean that you have to avoid any formatting altogether, but at the same time, don't go super fancy because you might be jeopardizing your chances of actually getting that information properly read and scanned by the applicant tracking system. So I hope that that makes sense. Um, Let's move to the next one. I know that you guys have some questions and I promise I'll get back to them. I just have a couple more points that I'll go through and then we'll get to the questions and the discussion portion. Um, okay, so next thing that clearly breaks your resume is when you have one generic resume for all jobs. And I know that I'm gonna probably sound like a broken record because everybody's talking about this and you've probably read that already a million times, but you truly do need to customize your resume to every job application. And you know, I know that it can be overwhelming and it can be daunting and it can be boring. And um, a lot of people try to find a shortcut and find a way to avoid having to customize your resume every single time. But trust me, it still takes time for you to send out that generic resume. And all of that time will be wasted because if you're targeting everything with just one document, it's not going to get you anywhere. It's like um, I use this analogy in one of my videos that I published recently on YouTube. And by the way, if you haven't watched any of my videos yet, you're more than welcome to uh, go find me on YouTube and subscribe to my channel. Um, I promised uh, my subscribers that as soon as I get to my first 1,000 on YouTube, I'm going to do a very special live answering your career questions. So something to look forward to. Uh, but anyways, so uh, one of the analogies that I used in a recent video was that if, you, if you're thinking, should I really customize my resume to every single job, think about it this way. If you have multiple targets in front of you and you only have one arrow to shoot with um, and try to hit those targets, would you just take that arrow, close your eyes and just blindly shoot, hoping that it's going to hit all of those targets at the same time with just one arrow? Or would you actually pick one target, take a couple seconds to aim properly and then shoot? Because I like it, it feels to me that the second approach gets you a much greater chance of actually hitting the target and your efforts do not go to waste. So the same thing applies to your um, job search and your online application process. I know that it's not the best thing to customize your resume for every job, but that's the idea. It's, it takes some time to aim, but by aiming, you increase your chances for success. And I feel like, you know, those chances are sl pretty slim as they are. So I wouldn't try to reduce them even further. So hopefully you do know that you need to customize your resume and you actually take some time to do that. One thing that can help you optimize your efforts, and that's kind of a little hack, I guess, is take, like maybe read through 20 or 30 job descriptions that you're interested in, and then try to group them based on the key things that they have in common. So you might get one group, you might get two or three, but I think that's tops if we're talking about targeting just one industry. So group them and then create a master resume file that is tailored towards, towards each of those groups. So what is gonna happen is next time when you run into a new 
opening and a new job description, you will think, hey, is it from group one, from group two, or from group three? If it's group three, that's the master file that I'm gonna use. Do I need to tweak anything here? Maybe you still might need to do minor tweaks, but it will be way, way faster if you do that groundwork and that homework beforehand. So analyze those job description, classify them or group them based on the things that they have in common, and then create master file for each of those groups and tailor that master file sometimes every now and then, but those ta that, that tailoring will be truly, truly minimal. So I hope that helps. And the last, I guess, thing, I know that I promised only three, but for whatever reason, I have another one in mind. So I guess that's a bonus one that I'm gonna share today. Um, the next thing that will truly break your resume and ruin your chances is including an objective statement. That's something that used to be extremely popular in resumes. That would be the thing that everybody includes right below their name and the contact info at the top. And I still, I still see objective statements every once in a while. So, you know, maybe you can write in the comments, anyone who is ever guilty of having an objective statement in their resume, maybe you used to have that and you updated that. In that case, good job. Or if you still have that, again, no shame in that whatsoever, because that's why we're here today. We're here to help you catch up with the latest trends in resumes and help you put your best foot forward. So objective statement, anyone? Let me know in the comments just by saying yes or just writing something quick to let me know that that's something that, that you once had in your resume or maybe you never had that, in which case, great. So guys, don't be shy. Again, there's no wrong or right answer or maybe it's just my comment section that is slow today, I don't know. Um, okay, yeah, used to have it. Well, not anymore, so that's great, Lindy. You updated that and that's awesome. There are some other people who dropped it, that's great. Um, okay, so for those of you who already dropped it, well done. For those of you who haven't yet dropped it, it's time, it's time guys, open up that file and drop it right now. Because honestly, and I'm gonna be brutally direct about this, is that employers, recruiters, couldn't care less about your objective. I'm sorry, I know that that sounds harsh, but that is the truth. So the thing that, again, is gonna make your resume look so much better and is gonna get them interested in your profile is a summary paragraph, whatever you can call it, profile, summary, executive summary, highlights of qualifications, whatever. The name doesn't matter right now. The point is that summary section needs to talk about how you can add value. And one of the latest trends in resume writing is that it's no longer only talking about the past, but it's more of a marketing pitch or a pro like a value promise, right? A value proposition for the future. So how you can leverage everything that you've gained and learned up until today in the future challenges that you're gonna run into when you get hired for the job that you're currently interested in. So think about it as a, I guess, marketing paragraph. It doesn't need to be long. It can be just a few, two, three short punchy statements but they need to focus around that value that you add to the table. And the thing is you can still say that you leverage this many years of experience or this kind of expertise or this kind of market industry, whatever knowledge, or you can even list some of the educational credentials that help you in, in the work. But anyhow, those would just be, they, they would never be the ultimate goal of that section, right? That will be just to show how you do what you do, how you manage to do a really good job and deliver the results that you're expected to deliver or even exceed those expectations. So think about your summary as a selling future-oriented paragraph that basically needs to, yes, it needs to summarize who you are and what you do, but then it needs to, sum, it needs to show a promise of value what's in it for the employer. That is always the ultimate thing that is on the mind of the hiring manager, the recruiter, the HR person, whoever it is, because they are hiring somebody because they have a problem, they have a challenge to resolve, 
and that's why that's why they need you so you need to show them that you have the ability to resolve that challenge and you leverage certain skills or certain core selling points or certain strength of yours to help make that happen and the other thing is um you know like kind of a little trend i guess you can call it that um a lot of people nowadays include a very short or a couple of very short quotes as testimonials um that that were given by their colleagues clients their managers whoever it is so that's kind of also a, a nice little hack that makes your resume a lot more enticing and compelling and then you know adds that personality and character to it and the best part is that you can grab those quotes from some of those recommendations that people have given you on LinkedIn. And if they haven't given you any, that's your next step to ask some people to give you recommendations on LinkedIn. And in general, if you know, if you have any questions about how to ask for recommendations on LinkedIn and why does that matter at all? Um, I did a couple of live streams on LinkedIn as well as YouTube talking about optimizing your LinkedIn profile. So I really recommend you go and check them out. Uh, some of them are longer, some of them are shorter, but anyways, I've answered like a ton of questions about optimizing your LinkedIn profile as well. And the last detail, last one for today, I promise before I, uh, I go to uh, your questions is the font of your resume. So when you're applying online and um, hoping to befriend the applicant tracking system, your font is not the most crucial thing. But if you are distributing your resume outside of that online application process, so maybe you have a referral or you're contacting recruiters directly, or maybe you have some networking going on and people are asking you for your resume, then the font actually becomes important because surprisingly a font can say so much about you know the entire document and give a certain vibe to it so if you don't want your resume to look like it came from last century i would say avoid times new roman because that's just something that has been clearly overused in the resume world for sure so these days there are so many better alternatives that are still neutral so nothing super fancy because one other thing to keep in mind is more and more people will be reading your resume on their mobile devices so even if you send them a PDF and all the formatting stays where it needs to be, you still need to make sure that it is readable on a quite small screen. So that's why those super fancy fonts that have a lot of those elements, like, um, you know, they, they look super like fancy and everything and sophisticated, they may not always be the best choice because they're not so easily readable um, on mobile. So my personal favorites are Cambria, um, Calibri, for some industries, I go with Arial, um, despite the fact that it's also a super common one. But the good news about Arial is that it's very, it's a very large font compared to like similar ones. So you can actually choose smaller font size and it would still be highly, highly readable and you know super clear at the same time. So that's why sometimes it's also a really good choice. And also, you know. For certain more creative people, um, there might be some uh, motivation to use and experiment a little bit, again, always within moderation and within reasonable limits. But at the same time, some creative font ideas could also work well because they can convey a little bit more of your personality and kind of get give you that unique look for the resume. So that is something that also can help you stand out. Okay, now let's check out your questions. Okay, I, I can see that uh, some people are also sharing um, font ideas like Perpetua, that's a good one. Um, Calibri. Yes, um, okay, so. Let's see what, um, okay. There was a question from Nirmal. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that well, so. What should we have in place of objective statements? So I hope I covered that already. Um, if you want some more details, you can also go onto my profile and check. Like I've, I've done a few different posts in terms of how to position yourself in that summary section of your resume. So you can just scroll back a little bit in under my activity and check out some of those older posts 
or I also did a couple videos on my YouTube channel. So again, you're welcome to check it out and also subscribe if you haven't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is a good question from Vitali. Word or PDF format for resume? So my general answer would be depends. So if in the application instructions, they are telling you to use a Word file, then obviously you need to follow those instructions. In pretty much every other case, I would go for PDF because honestly, these days, uh, all of the more modern applicant tracking systems, they um, equally like PDFs and Word docs, so that should work fine. And if you are distributing your resume directly, so if you're looking for ways to kind of avoid or go around the online application process and increase your chances for landing the job, in that case, definitely go for a PDF because you never know what device um, the other person might have and how they, your, you know, they might open the Word doc because the formatting usually changes like depending on whether they have a PC or Mac or desktop or mobile, whatever. So if you use PDF, you make sure that that formatting stays in place, which I think is always a good idea. Um, question from Salina, how about a picture? So um, Salina, I'm talking mostly about the North American market where we do not include pictures on a resume. I know that in some other countries that may not be the case. Um, so I cannot say for all countries, but I know that in most countries these days, people do not include pictures on their resume. Um, specifically North America, definitely not. If you're talking about other kinds of pictures like the you know, visual diagrams or some other things that you want to insert into your resume to give it a fancy decor or whatever fancy look, in that case, I think I already answered that question. All of those very extra fancy um, design elements, they may actually hinder the performance of your resume when it comes to um, it being scanned by the applicant tracking system. So I wouldn't risk that. Um, question from Astrid, should we include LinkedIn QR codes? Um, honestly, I, I cannot say for sure in terms of whether there is a place for it on your resume, because again, it means that you are targeting a person who will need to scan that QR code to check out your LinkedIn profile. But to scan that QR code, they would need to point with their phone at that code. So they need, they need to have two devices at the same time, as far as I understand. So that may not always be the best idea. But if you include a hyperlink, they can actually click on it and get redirected to your LinkedIn profile right away. So I think that that would work with more people. Again, some more progressive individuals might be using QR codes all the time, and that's great, but we never know who you're gonna come across, right? Whether you're targeting a progressive hiring manager who likes QR codes, or you're targeting someone a little bit more old fashioned. So if you give a hyperlink, I feel like it's a safer choice, but um, maybe there's no harm in including QR code, um, but at the same time, not sure how often it would be used in that, in that case. Okay, um, let's see what other questions we have. Um, okay, question from Ruben. How would you approach a profile that has different functional and industry experience? Um, so I'm not like, you know, I probably would have a ton of follow-up questions to really be able to give you an answer. But, you know, if you are talking about having an experience that is really diverse, so if you've been through a lot of different things and you've done a lot of different things and potentially you've been part of a lot of different industries, I would say that you always need to find a common thread in there. Because sometimes, I mean, personally, I think having diverse experience is great. But at the same time, it often looks like you lack targeting and you lack focus when you're talking about everything all at once. So that kind of falls under that category of having one resume that works for all kinds of jobs. That resume does not exist. Uh, I mean, you could have one resume, but it wouldn't work for you. So that's the problem. So if you have very diverse experience or diverse background, I would say that you need to focus on those transferable 
skills and transferable elements that can be clearly applicable in different scenarios. And then you can always connect the dots between that that thing that is transferable and something that you're currently aiming for. So the need in the business or uh, the challenge that you want to help this next company to resolve. So in that case, I would say there is extra need for kind of tying your value proposition to the needs of the company and being really specific in terms of how you are selling what you can do for them. So I hope that answers your question. But again, like I said, um, a ton of follow-up questions would be needed for me to really give you a productive and detailed answer. So if you are curious about how to single out those transferable pieces and transferable elements, um, you're more than welcome to go check out one of my previous live streams. I believe it was not the one, the last one I did, but the one before that. So all of them are saved on my YouTube channel. And also all of them are saved on my profile on LinkedIn, if you're joining from LinkedIn. So you can just go under my activity tab exactly where you're watching me right now and just scroll and watch the previous live. It is available there. The recording, you know, is there for you. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm just looking through the comments here. Wow, we have so many great, like, different industries, you guys. It's That's amazing. Okay, I think that's all I can see so far with the questions. Um, oh, okay. Got it. So... Uh, functional CVs. Yes. So you can have, basically, there are two different formats of resumes. There's a chronological one and there's a functional one. So in the functional, you kind of put the, well, the functional elements um, to the top and then you just give a quick chronology uh, at the very end. Personally, I always go for a mix between the two. So I do believe that there is space for highlighting some functional elements or doing like a highlight section at the top. But then uh, you know, doing um, doing the chronology is also important because when it comes to recruiters, especially, they always are going to be interested in your chronology. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, Daniel said hyperlinks are not ATS compliant. Yes, they're not. So the ATS will not be able to, in most cases, read a hyperlink but we were talking about distributing your resumes directly. So if you are sending your resume directly to a recruiter or a person, so not through the applicant tracking system, but actually using networking or um, you know your daily conversations to get your resume directly in the hands of that person. So in that case, um, you can use a hyperlink. Um, and I guess you know that's a subject for a whole other live stream, whether you know because obviously. I always try to highlight all of the cons of the online application process and how slim your chance of success is, even if you have the most amazing resume in the world, just because of how the process is built, it's really challenging. So my the point of today is not to tell you that you should only apply online, but it's to tell you that if you are still using part of that time, that your job search time on applying online, these are some of the things that you can do. But yeah, going back to the hyperlink point, that's not for the ATS, that's for distributing your resume directly. Uh, mm -hmm. um, question from Sergey: Is there any known problems with ATS recognition of the resume if it uses some uncommon font? Um, to be honest, I, I, mean, I mean, again, depends on what you define as an uncommon font. But as far as I know, uh, the applicant tracking system recognizes most of the fonts, but it's just that it doesn't matter for the system what font you're using as long as it can read the, the document. So, I mean, the point here is that, you know, I'm not encouraging people to use like super uncommon fonts because if they're so uncommon, there's probably a reason behind that. So maybe it's not the best readable font. Maybe it's, you know, there's something that is not, that does not just work really well about that font. So my advice is always, you know, 
if you want to experiment, experiment with, with moderation and within reason. So you can explore some Helvetica, Cambria, all of those guys. And I know that they're not super uncommon, but trust me, not that many people actually use, let's say, Cambria, or at least uh, not many people who, you know, haven't updated their resume in a while. So if you're keeping up with those latest changes and things, then, you know, probably you're more versed at choosing fonts and all of that. Um, so always experiment within reason, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Four pages resume, is that a problem? Um, yes, uh, definitely, unless it is an academic CV. So if you are applying outside of the academic slash education space, I would say four pages is a problem. I know that a lot of people might offer different opinions here and different perspectives, but trust me on this. We are living in a super fast paced world. Like people barely have a few minutes to watch through one video. And we're talking about companies that are hiring. And if they, if we're talking about companies that are hiring right now, they are flooded with resumes. So if they have to read through four pages, I would say it's going to be a problem. For most people who have, let's say, who are in the middle of their career or have maybe 10 to 20 years of experience, you can find a way to um, have only two pages for a resume. You don't, trust me, you don't need any more than that. Your resume is not your autobiography. You don't need to show everything you've done from the beginning of time. You just need to highlight the most relevant information. Because I guess one other thing that we can kind of take away from today is that your resume is just a snapshot of the most relevant information. What is relevant? It means relevant for this job that you're currently targeting. So we don't need to hear about things that happened when you were starting your career if you are already 25 years in or something like that. Just focus on the most relevant. And if you just feel like there is an absolute need to still mention something from that older background, just summarize it and call that section earlier experience and just include two, three short sentences that kind of give a general overview of, of what happened before the, the first role that appears on your resume. You don't need four pages unless it's something in the academic world. Okay. Um, okay. Um, is it still a good idea to mail resumes? Um, well, probably not because like who uses standard mail these days um, for hiring or anything like that? I mean, I might be wrong by saying that nobody, but um, in my world, nobody. So I would definitely not go for direct mailing your resume because you either find a way to send it digitally. And I don't just mean the applicant through the applicant tracking system or through the standard online application process, but still you can email your resume or you give it in person if you're actually meeting with somebody. So, you know, I, I just don't feel like there's a big place for mailing or at least, again, I may not be able to say that for all the countries though. Okay, question from Manfred. What's the place of Coursera and Udemy, Udemy certifications for a career change? Also, do you know if any tools able to assess how your resume performs against different ATS systems? So there may not be a tool that gives you that performance rating for the different ATS systems that you can compare, but uh, the number one tool that is uh, available is JobScan that gives you that score where you can, basically you copy your resume in one field and in the next one you copy the job description and it gives you that matching score. So how well your resume matches the job description. But here's the thing guys, be careful with those tools and there might be some other ones that do something similar. And the reason to be careful here is because your objective is not just to increase that matching rate because you'll be surprised that, you know, 
you can't just copy the entire and copy paste the entire job description into your resume and that will obviously increase your matching score but then when your resume gets through the applicant tracking system and a person looks over they will see that you just copy pasted the job description so that's not gonna sell you as a candidate and that's not gonna get you the interview so there's kind of it's like you're on thin ice when you're going after those matching scores, it's a good idea to use that as a benchmark, but it's not the ultimate goal. It's not the ultimate reason to have a 100% matching score between your resume and the job description. But as a benchmark, try job scan, it's a good one. Um, so going back to your first question, the place for those certifications in career change, I, I would say it depends because uh, some of those courses are really practical and um, and highly applicable, but most of them are pretty general. So they give you a general introduction into the topic and even some basic knowledge. But if you really need to master a new skill or something that you've never done before, you'll, you're very likely to need something more than that. So I wouldn't say that necessarily certifications like the ones you mentioned would be the highest asset but it could be a sign of showing like to show that you are serious about the new topic and you're looking into it but for most cases um you would need something more in depth to master that new skill and those certifications do not always do that okay um I guess the last question for today from Mihaela, in case if the company is asking to send by email the resume and cover letter, which format is recommended PDF or Word? If they are asking you to email, definitely go for PDF. Like I said, your formatting is gonna stay there. You know that they're gonna open the file exactly the way you created it without having anything move around or any weird changes happen because that has happened to me before. Again, different devices, older softwares, newer softwares, it, it can differ. So with PDF, you're safe. If you're emailing directly, there's no harm in PDF for sure. Okay, uh, well, guys, we're running out of time for today. So again, thank you all so much for joining. I'd love to hear your ideas for topics for my next uh, live streams. Uh, so I'm trying to do one of one live stream every couple weeks. Um, so far, I've been keeping up with that promise. Um, so, you know, I'm always looking for ideas for the topics that you'd like me to talk about. Uh, so please feel free to uh, drop your ideas in the comments here and I'll make sure to incorporate that in some of my coming live streams. Also, like I already mentioned, um, if you haven't checked out my YouTube channel, you're more than welcome to. I'd love to hear your feedback because when I hear your feedback, it motivates me to produce better content for you that can be even more helpful. Because I've been getting messages from people who have landed jobs, really cool jobs, just by using the strategies that I share for free in my posts, in my videos. And isn't that really amazing? Like that stuff motivates me to do more work like this. So your feedback, your likes, your comments, your following and your subscriptions, that's what gets me going and, um, you know, helps me to know what kind of content you want to see more of. So I always love this feedback. Um, feel free to message me, feel free to reach out directly. And um, I'll see you again in one of my next live streams.